Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gill at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Omar Ahmed, who is Assistant Professor of Psychology, Neuroscience, and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Michigan. His lab studies the neuroscience of spatial navigation and memory and how these neural systems are altered in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and epilepsy. Welcome, Omar. Thanks so much, Gil, for having me here. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So I want to start with your 2019 paper, the neural circuitry supporting successful spatial navigation despite variable movement speeds. Uh, you study uh, ants in here. So ants who have successfully navigated the, the long distance between their foraging spot and the nest dozens of times will drastically overshoot their destination if the size of their legs is doubled by the addition of stills. This observation reflects a navigational strategy called path integration, a strategy also utilized by mammals. Um, this is an interesting, <laughs> interesting study, Omar. So, so you, you're just essentially elongating the legs of ants and then that confuses them? Yeah, so this was a review article that we had written summing up the state of the field in how mammals navigate their environments. Yeah. And the study that we refer to there was a beautiful uh, work by Matthias Wittlinger and colleagues in Germany. So let's start with the basics of spatial navigation and why we should even care. So, you know, across evolution, successful spatial navigation is, as you can imagine, absolutely critical for every single behavior that animals carry out. So if you need to go find food, water, shelter, reproduce, and then you need to find your way home. But along the way, you might encounter predators or perhaps unexpected obstacles that make you take an unexpected left turn and take a longer path. Yet these animals such as ants and mice and rats and many, most other species will then turn around. Once they have their food, they will make a beeline, essentially a straight line back for their nest. Hmm. And they are constantly calculating. Their brains are somehow encoding how many left turns they've taken, how many right turns they've taken, how fast they've gone, how when they were stopped versus moving. And they calculate all of this. The ants in this example find their food, turn around and say, OK, I'm going to walk in this direction because this is going to get me home. So in that study by uh, Whitlinger and colleagues, what they did was once the animals, once the ants got to their food, they attached stilts. They doubled the length of the ants' legs yeah. and put them back down and said, OK, let them, you know, let them walk home. So but instead of walking back to their nest, the ants drastically overshot it. They walked significantly past their nest. So it's almost as if they're counting their strides, counting their steps back to the nest. Yeah, that is that is fascinating. So 
um, I don't know obviously too much about this, but uh, when I look at ants, they don't seem to follow straight lines. They, they, they seems to move around quite a bit. So if, if this uh, exercise that they're going through in terms of precisely counting steps and turns, I would have thought that they would take, uh, I, I'm talking about going to find the food now. Mm -hmm. Um, I would imagine they would have taken a more straight path, but I guess uh, you don't have an ex ante expectation of where the food is. Exactly. So you, have, it, you have to experiment, right? Exactly, there. because when you're looking for the food or looking for a mate or looking for water or looking for a new shelter, you don't quite know where to go and you have to explore exactly as you said. But once you've found what you were looking for and you just want to head home, that's when you can basically turn around and say, okay, I'm going to go home now. And this is something that ants are really good at, mice and rats that we study in my lab, they're really good at. And obviously us as humans, even without our GPS trackers, even before our GPS trackers, we've always been pretty good at that for the most part. Um, we know how to get home. Yeah, I mean, the key there, Omar, I think is we were good at yeah. it, but not anymore. Yeah, that, that, uh, those skills may be slipping a little bit, but, uh, and, and this is the reason we really care about the question because it's just evolutionarily critical. How does an animal or us as humans keep track of our path, our surroundings, our directional turns, our speed to then compute where we are and where we want to go? And I want to kind of just yeah. maybe perhaps mention the clinical importance of this to kind of put it in context. Yeah. So the vast majority of uh, persons with Alzheimer's disease suffer from what's called spatial disorientation, which is exactly what it sounds, that they are essentially unable to, let's say, find their way home. So they'll know where they're standing. They could tell you, I'm standing on Main Street and I need to get to State Street, but I can't figure out which direction to head in to get there. And, you know, my, my, my daughter's, uh, one of her earliest memories, she's four and a half now, but when she was uh, about two and a half, and I remember this partially because I was at the time writing a grant on spatial disorientation at home on a Sunday morning, and she sees um, she sees a very large dog in our backyard, which you know was both exciting and surprising, and she was a little bit scared by it. But um, then there was also a man with that dog, and and he had entered our backyard, and he seemed very much lost. So I kind of went out there, talked to him, and. Uh, helped him reorient himself and kind of uh, head towards uh, what he described to me as being his home. And later on, I've heard from his family that uh, he he had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So that's a very common uh, aspect of Alzheimer's and one that is severely debilitating for obvious reasons. Uh, yeah. I, I want to I want to go into that, but before we do that, I want to sort of flesh out the and mm -hmm. people a little bit yep. more. So, the um, it seems sort of a very complex um, process. I, maybe I'm, I'm not really thinking about it correctly. So the ant has to count steps, has to keep track of the turns uh, all through. It seems like a, a, a large amount of data to store. It's You're absolutely right. It's a monumentally complex computational problem at, at the heart of it. And yeah. so so how does the brain do it? And and why is it such a remarkable feat? And how can it, what are the building blocks, if you will, of being able to carry out this kind of remarkable spatial navigation? So historically, we should really kind of talk about two types of cells, maybe three types of cells that have been discovered in the brain. Yeah. Um, and when you, when you talk about spatial navigation, most people will start to talk about a brain region called the hippocampus, which yeah. traditionally is associated with memory because there was a, the case of a patient uh, many years ago who had epilepsy and the surgeons removed both of this patient's hippocampi on both sides and he was no longer able to form new memories. He goes by the acronym HM. And that's a classic case where we figured out, okay, the hippocampus is critical for memory formation. 
Yeah. But at the heart of it, what are hippocampal neurons doing to encode memory? How do they fire when, when you can record from them? And back in 1971, John O'Keefe recorded cells in the hippocampus as rodents were walking around in an open field. So just kind of walking around navigating. Yeah. And what he saw was kind of remarkable. One cell in the hippocampus would only fire when the rat was in a particular location of that environment. If you move the rat or if the rat moved itself to another part of the environment, there would be no activity in that neuron. And then when he came back to that same location, it would fire again. Take it away, stops, bring it back, fires again. So these neurons are now called place cells. They selectively fire only when the animal and this has been shown across many species, are in a, is in a given location. And if you record from a different cell, that will fire in a different region. And then let's say you're walking down a hallway or a rat is walking down a linear track. And let's say the first cell that fires is cell A. Then you'll see cell B, C, D, E. And the next time the rat does the exact same walk, you'll see A, B, C, D, E. The same cells in the same sequence. And yeah. this, this sequence of place cells is really the key to not only encoding space, but to memory itself. Hmm. So, so it's a different type of counting in some sense, right? So it, it's really a pattern that is forming and, uh, and the ant then is able to retrace that pattern in some ways. Right. So what the ant is doing is using this information, A, B, C, D, E, to yeah. keep updating where it thinks it is relative to the start point or relative to the destination. And you're right. It's, it is a series of patterns. And the, it's not just about space, though. So when you when you have a flashback to a memory you don't always kind of think of it as a photograph. You think of it as like a, a movie, right? It's, it's a sequence. It's an episodic memory. You recall that entire memory. And that memory yeah. might be you walking down the street. That memory for some people might be of, uh, of a car accident, which is particularly traumatic. But each of those memories is replayed as a sequence. And that's why these place cells, that sequence I just described, A, B, C, D, E, that's critical to how the hippocampus is encoding space and all other kinds of memories. And when you remember things, that same sequence gets replayed. A, B, C, D, E. Right. So a couple of things are important to then note about how these sequences are being used by those ants or by mice and rats, where this is more studied, to encode and navigate their environments. So it might seem, okay, well, you know, you've got sequences A, B, C, D, E. All they're doing is responding to your visual cues. Let's say you walked past um, a red light and then you saw uh, um, a, a particular kind of tree and then you saw some daffodils. So mm -hmm. it could be that the sequence being encoded in your hippocampus is entirely determined by what you see. So many experiments have been yeah. performed that have shown that that's not the case. So blind rats have place cells and have sequences of place cells. Deaf rats have sequences of place cells. Even anosmic rats, rats that cannot smell, they have sequences of place cells. And this one always kind of intrigues uh, students in particular. So now imagine you take a rat and put it on a hamster wheel. So place is no longer changing, right? The rat is standing on a hamster wheel running at different speeds. And so I typically ask my students here, so what do you think should happen? Should, should place cell A fire forever as the rat is running on this hamster wheel? Or will you get some kind of weird sequence? Let's say A, B, C, D, E, A, Q, P, R, T, you know, whatever it may be. And most initial guesses go towards saying, well, the rat is standing in the same position. So if it's running in the same position and these are place cells, you should only get one place cell firing uh, 
throughout the entire time. But what actually happens is once the rat starts running in that hamster wheel, you get a sequence of A, B, C, D, E. Let's say the rat leaves and comes back and starts again. Again, you get the sequence A, B, C, D, E. So now I may be complicating the picture here, right? This is no longer even space. <laughs> it's also yeah. time. Right, right. And so, so, so going back to the, the so when, when the ant is going to look for the food, the hippocampus is doing all this sort of storage of patterns uh, to, to get back. Uh, meanwhile, they have to make decisions on other sides of the brain, right? So, so this is almost, I don't know what the right word is, this is almost instinctually happening in the brain while they make decisions as to how to, you know, how to find the food and where to go. Precisely. It's, these calculations are happening, you could say, at a subconscious level. The, yeah. the, this cognitive map, as O'Keefe and colleagues called it early on, is being built up almost uh, instinctively, as you said, or subconsciously. And, yeah. and you, as you travel, you keep filling in the details, right? So the first time you ever enter an environment, you kind of have no idea. You might feel a little bit lost. Um, but then as you kind of keep navigating the streets or the hallways, you start to like form this cognitive map thanks to these place cells and other types of cells that I'm happy to also talk about. And together, these distinct elemental neuronal firing helps you form this cognitive map that then can interact with prefrontal cortical structures. And that's where the things you talk about decision-making and can, is, is kind of uh, attributed to, to the prefrontal cortex. So this communication yeah. between the prefrontal cortex, which is the decision-making center, and the hippocampus, which is a cognitive map center, if you will, is what's critical then, not just for the ants or mice or rats, but for, even for us, to figure out a way to really move around our environments. Yeah, it is a bit counterintuitive, right? So what if... So you, you mentioned the blind mm -hmm. rat uh, who also has place cells, who also forms these patterns. It, it's almost like it's a hardware. Um, I no, hate yeah, to use that's, the, that's <laughs> the computer, but it's a hardware process as opposed to software. Uh, you know, one would have thought that, you know, you just visually have some cues and you, you know, basically go back to those visual cues to find your way back. But that's not the case. It is exactly programmatic, and it is it is deep inside your brain. Yes, for the most part, you're absolutely right. So, the brain has this internal ability to create sequences and to encode information. And you know, yeah. this this was a this navigational strategy was recognized by Darwin. He called it dead reckoning. The animals he studied just knew where to go instinctively, if you will, and as you read out at the beginning, we often now call it path integration. And you're saying that this, because blind rats don't, because blind rats can have place cells, that shows that internally in the brain, you can encode sequences of information. And that is completely true. But the other thing the brain needs to do is to now take certain cues from the outside world. They could be chemical, they could be uh, sensory in nature, visual, auditory, and use them to modify your map. And this is why you can yeah. imagine that rats, for example, that can see better will actually navigate better, even though both of them have place cells. So. Yeah. So, so, so going back to the the ant ants on stills. Um, so why why are they missing it? Uh, they're not able to back integrate some of the visual cues. Yeah, so, so that, that study was done on uh, desert ants, who essentially they are not using they're kind of programmed not to use their external cues that much. They're kind of relying on an internal calculation, and by the time they get to their food, 
they have done that calculation. It's done, there's certain, they know that I need to walk back 10 meters to get back home. And they've also got an internal representation of how long their stride is. So they've basically calculated, I need to take, let's say, 500 steps to get back home. And then when you put stilts back on them, that program, you know, which you kind of refer to as kind of this hardware calculation that's already been done, has already told them, you need to yeah. take 500 steps. And they just keep taking those 500 steps because there aren't enough visual cues available to them to them to correct for any errors now if there were you would think they would get smarter about that and say wait a second i've taken 250 steps and i'm standing next to something that looks exactly like home maybe i should stop yeah that is that is amazing um and so, and I want to get to the, the disease states that you want to talk about, but just very quickly, um, do, you, do you think human brain uh, does the same? Obviously, we get a large amount of data, uh, visual data, uh, as we um, navigate. Um, w would we have gone to a point that we don't really need those types of place cell type? Process. I think we, we, like most other species, have a combination of both internal and external calculations. Um, and yeah. it, you nailed it by saying that we're a visual species compared to the rat, for example, which you know really uses its sense of smell. And the rat hippocampus is strongly innervated by olfactory information. And olfactory meaning smell. So... Mm the rats can actually encode sequences of olfactory cues as well. Um, and, and they use olfactory cues to form their place cells in addition to internal signals. Whereas we are really, really good at use, using our remarkably acute visual abilities to navigate our worlds. But at the same time, we still do have that internal sense of space. And putting, I should also yeah. say, putting the two together is really the key. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned there are two other types of cells. I was just going to ask, you know, the the place cells, um, I would imagine there are a large number of them. Uh, are there any studies that that looked at behavior if you were to artificially turn them off? Without, without hippocampal activity, the spatial navigation yeah. abilities of most animals are indeed impaired. And I should... Now add that the hippocampus does not work alone. There are other regions that are also critical and at least two other cell types. One of them is a lot like a place cell, but it's called a grid cell. But in this case, mm -hmm. it's found in a brain region called the enteroanal cortex, uh, discovered by the Mosers in Norway. And the 2014 uh, Nobel Prize was actually awarded for the discovery of both place cells by John O'Keefe in 1971 and jointly grid cells in 2005 by the Mosers. So critical cells, that's, that's how important they are. They've, you know, they've been recognized with the Nobel Prize. And the grid cells are kind of also like GPS cells because they're encoding space as well, but they're encoding it in this remarkable triangular hexagonal kind of pattern that creates a tile of, uh, of firing across the entire environment. And people mm -hmm. are still working on understanding exactly how enterinal grid cells and hippocampal place cells interact to give rise to the cognitive map. But what's clear is that they are two essential parts. I should add one more cell that James Rank and Jeff Tauby uh, first kind of uh, reported on which is called a head direction cell. So what do you need to be able to tell how far you've walked? Well, you need to know how fast you've been going. You need to know where you are, where you've been. But you also critically need to keep track of your direction at all times. And there are other regions in the brain, such as the post subiculum and something called the anterior thalamus, where you find these things called head direction cells. They're almost like compass cells. So imagine that in a room, you're looking towards the window. 
NSL will fire only when you're looking towards the window. When you look away from that window, that, that cell will stop firing. So it's a very simple cell to understand in that sense. It encodes when you're looking at a particular direction and not others. Yeah, it's a perfect segue into, so th there is an article about your work in the Michigan News recently. University of Michigan researchers identify a unique neuron that computes like a compass. And, and um, this neuron, it, it is present in, in all so, atoms? Yeah, so this, I'll, I'll have to uh, give a little bit of background about this neuron and about the brain region that we found it in. Um, and I actually haven't mentioned this brain region yet. And it's, it's a brain region called the retrosplenial cortex. And so far, you and I have talked about the importance for the brain and for the animal to put together your internal world, what plan you have, where you think you are, and your external world, what you're looking at and where you, where you need to go, what cues you're seeing. Yeah. Well, that seems to be the job for this one particular region called the retrosplenial cortex. It, it actually gets mm. inputs from both your visual parts of your brain, as well as your spatial parts of your brain, as well as the parts of your brain that encode head direction. So you can imagine that, you know, if you were to create a computer to calculate where you are and where you want to go, what kinds of information would you want that computer to have? Well, you'd want it to know where you are. You'd want it to know where you're looking at all times. You'd want it to know what your visual cues are telling you. And in this case, you'd also want it to know how much you think you've moved, which is a copy of your action plan. It's, it's a lot like designing an autonomous car in some ways. You know, it's, it's, and the brain has really solved this problem, evolutionarily speaking. And this region called the retrosplenial cortex sits there integrating this information rather beautifully. Um, and before I talk about those cells, I think it's important to give a flavor for what happens when the retrosplenial cortex isn't working. So yeah. I'm, I mentioned yeah. in Alzheimer's this severe spatial disorientation. There's also severe spatial disorientation in Parkinson's disease. So I'm going to read out a couple of quotes, if that's OK, just to kind of give you a feeling for yeah. what's involved here. So here's a quote from 1987 um, in a paper by Hofstadt about a person with Parkinson's disease. So he said, I used to walk alone in the wood, fog or no fog. But when the symptoms of Parkinson's disease appeared, I noticed I could not orient myself anymore. And in case of fog, I got lost. Now I am too disabled to get lost anymore. There's a lot there, right? There's, that's, an, that's a remarkably insightful quote. In case of fog, I got lost. So going back to what we talked about earlier, you need to put your internal plan, which is, look, I've gone for a walk and now it's time for me to go home. But how do I get home? Well, I've taken all these turns. I can't see, though. But my brain should have calculated all of this itself. Internally, it should have kept track of where I am, how much I've walked, what directions I've turned in. And even if there's fog, normally he would have been able to walk back home. But now because there's fog and because yeah. those visual impairments, uh, visual cues cannot be seen, he gets lost specifically. And then he also says, now I am too disabled to get lost anymore. And that's because later on for him, the more motor deficits, the muscle movement deficits of Parkinson's kicked in. One more related quote there, just to kind of round yeah. that out. He was yeah, referred yeah. to our department. This is a separate person. He was referred to our department two weeks ago while driving his car. He suddenly realized he was unable to mm -hmm. recognize the streets along his way home. He got lost and had to call on some passerby to help. Since then, the patient has been severely disoriented in space. Now, you might think, OK, does this person have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's? Well, the answer is actually neither. They had damage to a part of their brain called the retrospinal cortex. And you can hopefully recognize the similarity in those uh, disorders. It's all about spatial disorientation, spatial orientation. And the retrospinal cortex is what does that. So in our work that you mentioned earlier, we were looking at 
the retrospinal cortex and what kinds of cells live there because uh, despite a lot of beautiful work that's been done on this brain region it's still relatively understudied so we're trying to figure out the brain rhythms in this region the cells in this region how do they work how do they put all these complex pieces of information together well one of the things we found is that there's a cell in there that computes like no other cells that we had seen in the cortex so many cortical cells and they're called regular cells regular spiking cells if you will they love to compute change yeah. so when you turn your head they'll encode the change in your head direction but they won't keep firing but this cell that we call the low rio base cell which is a bit of a technical name but this cell is small and hyper excitable my student uh, ellen brennan who found these cells she call, likes to call them the little cell that could or the little neuron that could because it just likes <laughs> to keep going and keep going and keep going so when it gets that same amount of small yeah. input it can keep encoding your current head direction even if you're not moving your head and that's critical right because if you want to keep track of where you've been and keep that calculation going to keep adding on information about which way you were looking and then which way you turned again and then which way you turned and how long you turned uh, how long you continued to look in one direction you need this kind of special kind of neuron to compute that information so 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 that is that is what you mean by cells that compute like a compass so um retrospinal cortex as you mentioned sort of an integration hub um that takes lot of different inputs right a um, lot of different types right. of inputs it sounds to me um and then integrates them into uh, some sort of a, a direction finder and um yeah it it is really truly fascinating to think about parkinson's uh as as a disease state where you have navigational confusion um obviously navigational confusion is is identified in alzheimers as a symptom but 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 what what you're saying is that it's more foundational than that these are not symptoms these are really to some extent causes um i would still, disease i would still refer to them as as symptoms but what it what is getting at is yeah. is that in these neurodegenerative disease states there is an underlying pathology that is perhaps affecting the retrospinal cortex in the same way so what we yeah. what, what what we think is important to do is to find is to consider both alzheimers and parkinsons conditions and to understand what is this underlying pathological change that in the case of the retrospinal cortex is causing it to no longer be able to optimally carry out its job and first of all is it indeed the retrospinal cortex there is a lot of information supporting that but not 100% conclusive so that's that's the direction in which we're heading with our research right now and and how uh, i i don't know if if yeah. this is a way to think about it but how big is this reach yeah, yeah it's a it's a great way to, great point it's not that big so in yeah. in it's bigger in rats and mice than it is in humans but it's it's mm. what makes it special really is what you already hit upon which is its ability to integrate because it is sitting at this ideal hub where every piece of information you need to kind of try to put together your visual cues your motor plan your directional heading and your spatial information is coming in here and that's key you know so it's you you earlier referred to the distinction between hardware and software well you know in the brain the, the two are often very tightly interlinked but without the appropriate hardware and by that in this case i mean without the appropriate connections to the appropriate other brain regions you cannot carry out that computation so really a good way to think about the brain is who for any brain region who provides inputs to it how are those inputs processed and what is output it's m- much like a, how you would think about a computer program in that way
Yeah, I was just thinking about mm -hmm. machine learning analogs here. So integration is always a complex task uh, in any, any system. Um, and here you have different types of stimuli coming in and you have to integrate them. You have to make a decision. Presumably you will have conflicts in those signals. Uh, in, the, in the machine learning parlance, you know, sometimes you have to do some sort of a voting to, to, you know, to reach an optimum decision. Um, do, you, do you see evidence of, uh, is it possible that it could receive sort of conflict signals from and different channels? I think channels? It's, an, it's an open, not a completely open problem, but at least as far as how the retrospinal cortex supports error detection is a relatively open problem. Yeah. Um, and a critical one, as you're getting at. So let me go back to head direction cells to try to suggest what the field currently views as possible solutions. So yeah, we talked about the retrospinal cortex is putting together all of this other information. And one of the inputs that it's getting is from head direction cells in a brain region called the thalamus. The thalamus is where you find the most basic and the most in, in terms of percentage, head direction cells. So really it's where the bulk of head, basic head directional encoding happens. And the thalamus then projects to the retrospinal yeah. cortex. So where's the error detection here? Well, not yet, right? What I haven't mentioned is that the retrospinal cortex then sends back dense projections back to the thalamus. And in fact, almost every cortical region does this. And the brain is full of these beautiful loops. It's, it's completely driven by recurrent loops. In this case, the thalamus goes to the retrospinal cortex. The retrospinal cortex goes back to the thalamus. Now you can immediately see, you know, if you kind of uh, think about classical artificial neural networks or machine learning techniques, that this is already providing you with the natural neural network equivalent of error detection and feedback. So there are, in fact, in many thalamic regions, there are 10 times or more inputs coming from feedback signals from the cortex than there are from sensory inputs. So the feedback is strong, immense, mm -hmm. and not perfectly understood. But what it is able to do here is that the retrospinal cortex is actually sitting in a beautiful position to be able to take the feedback that is calculating, and we have to figure out that computation. That is what we're chasing. What is exactly, can we basically have a computer do that calculation if we understand it well enough? So it's taking a bunch of these other inputs, visual, motor, combining it with the head direction inputs, and now is in a position to take the computed error back to the head direction cells and to be able to tell them, you know, continue firing in the way you're doing, or perhaps you need to adjust your firing in a certain way. Mm -hmm. When you say head direction, Omar, uh, how, how does the human brain baseline it? Uh, we don't have any magnetic capabilities. Uh, are we using the yeah, sun so and the many moon Many birds will kind of use celestial cues, such as the sun and stars, as they're navigating. But even there, how does one head direction cell come to be, is kind of what you're saying. How does one head direction cell, let's say in this brain region that I mentioned, the thalamus, come to be? And it has to, it goes back to our vestibular system. You know, some people will call it the sixth sense, right? So it's, 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 a, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a remarkably uh, evolutionary speaking, ancient uh, encoding sensory system, but it perhaps doesn't get as much attention as it deserves. So as you turn your head, the vestibular apparatus in your ear can detect those rotations. That same apparatus can also detect acceleration yeah. of your head. So everything we're kind of talking about, direction, speed, you can see that the vestibular system sitting in your inner ear is really ideally positioned to help those computations. And in the case of head direction, as you, as you asked about, that vestibular information starts in the inner ear, goes through a few routing channels, if you will, where computations are performed in your brainstem, and then gets to this part of the brain that I call the thalamus, that, that I mentioned earlier, the thalamus, where head direction cells are located. And this computational pathway, if you integrate 
your angular velocity, you can encode the direction. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I'm mm -hmm. thinking if you put a modern human mm -hmm. in the middle of an open field with no visual clues, right? Yep. Um, you know, cover the eyes. Uh, I think that human is going to get lost very quickly, right? Um, so have we lost a lot of the yeah, capabilities? And, and uh, evolutionary speaking, I guess you're kind of getting it. Yeah, it seems like there may be animal species out there that are far better at performing yeah. navigation without visual feedback than we are. And the long, the more, you know, you can, you yeah, can almost kind yeah. of, uh, you've probably, many kids have probably played this game too, but like close your eyes and try to like count, uh, count a few steps and try to like get <laughs> to the end of the hallway without bumping into the wall, you know, and get as close as you can. Um, yeah. And the further away the wall is, the more errors you make. So you're accumulating errors with every step you take because you're unable to take that external visual information and use it to error correct and reclassify exactly where you think you are. Um, but at the same time, yeah. uh, people who have lost their sight are able to compensate and come up with different mechanisms to actually try to navigate mm. those kind of uh, environments better. You know, and let's talk also, I mean, you know, so bats with echolocation, yeah. they, that's, they have a completely different navigational strategy that doesn't really depend on visual cues. Yeah, I was wondering, Omar, so maybe the brain has gotten lazy, right? The, 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 vision, the, the vision system right. is so good that you can pretty much do what you need to do without the, you know, sort of the, uh, the, the hardware operating system you are given. <laughs> you, know, you got nice apps you put on top of it that seems to do the job pretty well. You don't care about the operating yeah. system anymore. Um, and over time, we seem to have lost, uh, you know, even people driving around in, in the car today, I would argue they're going to get lost. Yeah, if you've GPS, never had to navigate maybe. a particular environment without using your GPS, you will get lost. You're absolutely right. Because it's, it's the classical example of the GPS is now just giving you that visual feedback information without you having to kind of pay attention. And what happens when you pay attention? You learn. And so that when your attention is directed towards encoding the navigational paths you're walking through, that, you know, you can, is what you're kind of getting at is, is what would lead you to form a better, stronger, more appropriate cognitive map. And if you know you don't need to do that and you're not paying yeah. attention to where you're going and you're just using the GPS, then yes, you don't need to form that map because it serves no purpose to you. Yeah, so the morale of the story here is that the more apps you have, the less capable yeah, that's, uh, your brain is probably, going to be. Probably fair. And, you know, at the same time, I guess we should also point out that <laughs> your brain is probably learning to multitask even more, for better or for worse. Um, the more apps you have, the more other things you need to be able to juggle at the same time and uh, it, it seems like parallel processing that the brain also supports is just getting more and more enabled. Yeah, so I want to ask you about that. I know that it's not in the paper. Uh, is there any evidence that the human brain think, is getting um, more adept at parallel processing? I, I don't think there is yet. You know, so if you, if you want to kind of uh, make predictions yeah. over the next hundreds of years, perhaps we could kind of go there. But um, the architecture is what the architecture is. It's already, but it, you can, expl depending on the needs of the computational problem, you can exploit that architecture in different ways. Yeah, and the conventional wisdom has always been, I think that a human brain is not very good at parallel processing, multitasking uh, and all that, um, but, 
But we are in a fast-changing environment. Those uh, heuristics may not be... Yeah, no, I think it's a good problem and being studied by uh, enough other groups and not by myself. So I'm not definitely not the expert on the abilities of our brain to multitask. But it's, it is yeah. clear from the literature that you pay a cost when you have to do context switching, which is what you have to do when you're multitasking when you have to think about one thing and then the other. Hmm. There is a neural cost associated with that uh, for context switching. So that cost will almost always be yeah. there. But despite that cost, it is probably possible to keep training ourselves to be able to multitask better and better. At the same time, I would guess, and, and the literature mostly supports this, which is that if you're trying to do two things at once, you will uh, be slightly less efficient than you're when doing one thing and then doing the next one sequentially, simply because of the cost of context switching. Yeah. And and I would imagine over time, we might develop right. better cash. So the, the context switching cost. Driven, yeah, and that would be an interesting, down, possibly. you know, just kind of thinking about it algorithmically. I mean, I, 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 I come at this from a computer science background, and I think you do too. Um, you know, I'm kind of thinking about uh, yeah. how you would change the brain's algorithms to kind of enable multitasking to just happen better uh, is a fun problem, not a not a trivial one by any means, but definitely one that's worth thinking about a lot in the future. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there will be some, obviously, in very short time frame, you won't get any selection pressures, but there is clearly selection pressures on humans today to be more efficient in multitasking and, and, and reducing that context switching cost that you mentioned. And so um, I don't know if you can take a, an adult brain and make it better, but uh, perhaps uh, I want to get your view on this. If you start from time equal to zero, doing all of that stuff, then you know uh, your brain might yeah, develop I mean, it's, a um, differently, potentially. I'm trying to think of it as from the perspective of uh, a bunch of hippocampal neurons encoding context. So now if you've always trained yourself that your, your context is just larger, there's not just visual information, but there's also the auditory information of you uh, listening to a song or, or a podcast in the background while you're writing your paper or uh, while you're practicing for uh, your, your soccer team, right? So you're adding on information yeah. and perhaps the very meaning of context is kind of changing here. It's a, what it's a, it's a difficult word mm. to define context and it's loosely defined because a lot of very different things can go into it yeah i also think uh, i don't know much about this omar but i also think that um the mm. the idea that we can google it uh, means that we don't have to store a lot of information anymore it is actually a waste of the brain to store any information because you can Google it. And so in, in such a situation, you actually have excess capacity that yeah, and, you know, potentially the, utilize. Uh, I'll be honest, one of the things that kind of drove me to kind of enter neuroscience was this, um, this kind of dream of having this uh, little tiny black box that we just carry along with us that encodes all of the memories we don't want to store in our brain but we can somehow access whenever we need to, right? I mean, and, and I guess, yeah, that is pretty much Google now. It's just that you have to type it in rather than just kind of think it. Um, but the foundation of many, many of an AI novel has kind of, uh, many a science fiction novel has kind of uh, depended on that. So yeah, without needing to store all that information or you, you are perhaps enabling your brain to carry out other computations a little bit faster. And frankly, the information comes back in a more reliably recalled way. But you now have to trust mm -hmm. Google. Right? So you have to trust that the in <laughs> and I think this is this is really something that kind of goes to the 
educational found the foundation of what the brain is and how you know why we have education why we do need to learn things why there needs to be a foundational yeah. um basic level that is a hundred percent trusted because the brain like uh, in computer science you you're probably familiar with this the the famous garbage in garbage out motto where if you train uh, a network yeah. on information that doesn't really make sense or is not true um, the network will believe that information and it will produce that as an output well so there is still a need for education and learning about basic true facts because the brain needs to be our brains need to be trained on what is real and what is not and encode that information so that when it sees things that may not fit it's in a position to evaluate them appropriately. Hmm. I want to touch back on the, the diseases. Uh, we, we briefly mentioned Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Uh, I want you to speculate a little bit. So, um, you know, the, the disease states we are seeing today is as a function of what we believe is happening in the human brain. If, if all of these things that we talked about is actually changing the human brain as we look forward, um, these diseases could be different in the future, right? Um, if, if these diseases are lack of information, that can be supplemented a lot easier than lack of process. So, so do you see uh, treatment modalities changing or um, even diseases um, changing in the future? A couple of different ways to think about that. So so at the heart of pathology for example in in alzheimer's the the if if the kind of information you're encoding is changing over the next 100 years is changing <clears throat> excuse me i don't think that'll necessarily change the pathology underlying alzheimer's disease because that is the, again going back to the hardware the molecular hardware the cellular hardware if you will that's underlying Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, that's not going to change. And it's, it's, so that's, that's why we need to find a solution uh, that is at a molecular cellular level uh, and pharmacologically can target the right targets to try to prevent, slow down, reverse the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, for example. And But uh, Omar, I'm the, mm -hmm. so, if you have your black box that be mm -hmm. um, that can be embedded in the brain, in, in essence, you you take you know sort of the memory right. deficiency of the brain and replace it with silicon. Um, then uh, yeah, that's fair. It so would be different, right? If you're what you're kind of getting at our brain computer interfaces, essentially that can be efficiently accessed by persons with Alzheimer's, for, for example, to be able to compensate for memory or other deficiencies. Now, here's where it kind of gets tricky. To access that black box, that brain-computer interface, you need to have a firm idea of what context or what kind of information you want to look up. And, and the question is, can you always have that clear idea? So. You know, so my uh, my mom's my my grandmother uh, always struggled to. She had dementia uh, near the end of her life, and so she rec start, struggled to recognize my mother. Uh, for, and you know, I think many many people have kind of seen this. Yeah. Now, let's take your kind of uh, brain machine interface solution and try to implement it there. So, my mother walks in, and my grandmother sees her. What does she do with a black box to say, I need to recognize this person? How does she trigger that? Where does that information go? Yes, it may be possible, but even for that solution to be implemented, we would have to understand the computations being performed in healthy and perhaps brains with Alzheimer's to a far better level than we do today to be able to even kind of think of that kind of a solution. Like, what is the context that needs to be fed into the black box to be able to produce an yeah. output from the black box that could help her recognize, in this case, my mother? Yeah, I know that I'm simplifying it too much, but yeah, so 
mm -hmm. know, I, I was thinking that the process becomes more important than the information itself. Right now, we are losing both process and information. We don't have a way to way to resolve that. To the, to the extent that we, in the future, get, have a solution to restore memory, restore information, um, what you're saying is that you still lack process. So that that Parkinson's uh, patient getting lost in the fog, um, if if he needs to essentially um, fire a process saying, I want to get home, and at that point, he is, you know, auto-navigated home by the black box, right? Um, it, it is, it is the, I think the yeah, process and, might get and even more important. In the earlier stages of even Alzheimer's and in the case of the uh, person with Parkinson's getting lost in the fog, I think the brain computer interface solution does make a lot of sense. For example, for the person with Parkinson's lost in the fog, if now if they have their phone on them and the GPS tracker is working and they have the conscious recognition that that's what they want to do, then they will be able to navigate home no problem at all. So that problem yeah. is almost already kind of solved. But it's the it's the level where perhaps in advanced stages of the disease, where the you need to bring into your state of consciousness that this is the problem I now need to solve. And and if you can kind of get into that mm. zone and yeah. understand what that zone means, then yeah, then yes, then you can perhaps interface with any computational devices to better solve that problem. But you know, perhaps at the heart of it, what we're kind of really getting at is, uh, what does it mean to enter a goal for your mind into your consciousness and how do you do that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's uh, yeah. a lot of developments, obviously, in both computer science as well as in neuroscience. So things are it looks like things are developing quite fast. I want to finish up with your other paper. Running speed alters the frequency of hippocampal gamma oscillations. Um, so this is related to what we are talking about. Um, uh, so sp successful spatial navigation is thought to employ a combination of at least two strategies, uh, landmark cues and path integration, as we talked about. Um, running speed. Uh, so, so how does yeah, the so running speed... Uh, yeah, going back it. to that ant, for example, it it could have been walking yeah. north for one minute or for 10 seconds, let's say, to make the math simpler. And the distance it covered, let's say it has yeah. no other visual cues or anything else that it's using, and it's keeping track of this completely internally. The distance it covered depends on its speed and the amount of time it walked in that direction. So to have a true dead reckoning yeah. system that can internally compute this all the time, it's critical to track your speed and to use your speed to carry out that computation. So because you know distance is speed and time. So if you can now track your running speed and your neurons can track your running speed and then use that running speed variable to compute distance as well as direction, which and the directional information is coming from other sources, perhaps. Then and only then do you have an internal representation mm -hmm. of space that is independent of running speed. Because let's take it another way. Let's say that you're not really paying attention to your visual cues. And if you're walking down a street that you walk down every day of your life, but one day you're walking at, uh, like, let's say running down at... Uh, two miles an hour versus six miles an hour. That shouldn't make a difference to how you perceive your space, to where you think yeah. you are, to where you think you want to go. And, and it often doesn't because our brains are really good at kind of factoring out speed. If we go back to those place cells that we started with, remember they kind of fired in particular locations. They fired yeah. in one part of that hallway. We said A, B, C, D, E. So what happens if you just walk through that hallway much, much faster? Do you only go A, B, C, and the hallway is over? Or do you do A, B, C, D just a lot faster? 
clearly the second solution is the optimal yeah. one because now your encoding of space doesn't change and hence your encoding of where you think you are and where you want to go doesn't change right. so the brain has evolved a lot of different ways parallel ways and integrative ways of encoding running speed and one of the things we found in in that study was we looked at brain rhythms so what are brain rhythms well brain rhythms are the summed activity if you will of a lot of neurons working together and if you can record brain rhythms with eeg electrodes you can even see them you know through the skull then what are they good for well there's a certain rhythm called gamma rhythm that comes up when we're paying attention when we're decision making when a part of the brain is active and doing its active job that's when that part of the brain becomes active and shows gamma rhythms so what are gamma rhythms good for well in in humans it's also been shown that people whose gamma rhythms are slightly faster can actually do a visual perception task faster so your brain's almost computing faster think of it as like a the clock speed for your computer you slightly speed up your clock speed so that you get more computations yeah. done in each clock cycle so what what we found in that study was that in the hippocampus remember that's where spatial navigation is perhaps best studied and where place cells are found when these rats were running faster it's not that their gamma got got completely suppressed or or changed in some massive way but instead it just got a little bit faster with faster speeds so the amount of information that they're processing gets shrunk into a slightly smaller period of time and we believe that that's a critical component not the only one but that speeding up of the hippocampus's clock cycle if you will is a critical component to being able to compute faster when you're moving faster so that your place cells can remain fixed in place yeah it's a neat simple kind of uh, yeah that seems you know, like so a neat thing if you want to encode the, the same amount of information but now you're moving faster just speed up your clock cycle right <laughs> yeah so yeah but this is a really fascinating area so so in conclusion omar um so you know it seems like the brain is highly specialized i, I guess we should not be too surprised by this uh, when animals started um from plants uh, you know their primary competence was navigation and uh, right from the beginning i think um, they would have put lot of selection pressure selection pressure into getting the navigation equation correct because their whole survival depended on it so space time and speed as you say they're all important um and your lab does a lot of work in this area so as you look forward 5 10 years um where do you think where do you think this will take us there are multiple directions we talked about one is in the area of disease management alzheimers parkinsons everybody is living longer we're all getting older those diseases are going to be at a higher incidence level um how do you think those things uh, those diseases might be treated in the future that's one direction the other direction is uh, since you're coming from the computer science background as well um you know some people believe the artificial intelligence route we are on today is misguided um it is the brain doesn't work anything like <laughs> the computers uh we try to program and anybody who thinks those things can be advanced to uh what the brain does is is probably um uh, probably uh misguided but others say it's just a it's just a problem of throwing more silicon and more money at the problem and we will replicate the brain so i want to get your um get your views on both of this first on the disease management area are things going to change and and second sort of the convergence of artificial intelligence think, um, and uh, and neuroscience let me give an answer that kind of uh, covers the overlapping solutions to both of those perhaps so the brains you know the, yeah. uh, many 
most of the time, there are two very different groups who are tackling the kind of questions you're talking about. On the one hand, there's kind of the, uh, you know, the wet science, if you will, the, the experimental setup where you kind of go in there, you record from neurons, you look at the molecules one by one, it's painstaking and you figure out how different genes and cells interact to give rise to a pathology or to a behavior. On the other hand, you have artificial intelligence, which is kind of loosely, perhaps less and less loosely as time passes, based upon how we think the brain works at its fundamental level. But what you kind of what, what I think we kind of need to kind of bridge yes. those two levels is to think about the algorithms at a computational level being implemented by the brain to solve problems. So, and by that, I don't just mean correlational. And I don't just mean mm -hmm. if we take away a part of the brain, what happens? What I mean is the essential tiny details that are the fundamental building blocks of neural, natural neural computations. So for example, this is why we care about that little low rio based cell sitting in the retrospinal cortex. It has evolved to receive inputs from yeah. directional and spatial uh, pieces of information. It's clear, it's, it's just getting those two pieces of information. Now, how does it use them? Why is that computationally advantageous? And if you understand that, you might understand, then be able to ask, okay, how is that precise computation altered in an Alzheimer's state? Which part of that computation is gone? How can we repair that computation? And similarly, if you understand those computations, what you might find is that now here's the natural neural network algorithm that is just far better suited to building the next generation of artificial neural network algorithms than just throwing more silicon at the problem. We, we've constantly learned that nature has a way of solving problems far better than we, what we can even imagine, right? And Yes, AI has come a long way, but perhaps there are certain simple computational principles or rules still sitting in there. And you know, I think the answer is almost certainly yes, that we do not yet understand, but when we do, we will gain new insight into how the brain computes and how those identical algorithms used by the brain can help us create better artificial computing machines. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Omar. I, I think there's one big difference between artificial intelligence and the brain, and, and that is AI requires a lot of data, and the brain doesn't require a lot of data uh, to make decisions, uh, to, to do uh, things we all marvel at, right? Um, and even the internal communication channels are a few bits of information that is moving around. And so it, it seems to me there is something fundamentally different from the machines that we have been designing yes, I mean, you and know, how when the you, brain works. Um, Do you agree with that? I've kind of, um, you know, my, my journey into my current position has been a little bit circuitous because I've kind of worked on the computational and experimental sides and with humans and rodents and kind of come back to where I am now. but. The, the, I guess the main lesson I've learned is very similar to what you're saying, yeah. which is that there are two problems. You can solve a problem using a, a solution that you come up with, or you can ask, how does the brain solve that problem? And the answers to those two questions are almost never the same. Mm. So, and to me, the, what drives me <laughs> forward every day is how does the brain solve that problem? But at the same time, that doesn't mean what we learn about how the brain solves that problem isn't going to benefit AI in the future or what we think about computational science in the future. Because the brain solution to that problem has had a lot more time to evolve and perfect itself than anything else we've come up with yet. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's an architecture question, architecture problem, right? Uh, is that we, we don't really have the architecture that will allow us to use the heuristics um, and the algorithms that you talked about that the brain uses. We cannot implement them because yeah, we don't really fair. have I mean, the I, architecture. You know, to use simply them. put, I agree.
And so, so the challenge for AI, I think, is, you know, in some sense, uh, you know, if it needs to, maybe the goal of the AI, goal of artificial intelligence is not replicating the brain, but really about automation, to automate away the mundane things humans do today. And that is, machines are pretty good at that. But the alternative goal of, uh, of sort of replicating the brain. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that is fair because a different direction. there are just so many principles being used by neurons and their subcomponents and neurons working together and brain regions working together that are orders of magnitude different from how we are currently trying to implement AI solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Yeah, this has been great, Omar. Thanks so much for spending time with me. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.